Welcome everybody. I'm just going to give it another few seconds to see if anyone else pops in. Um, very welcome to our first Women in STEM seminar session. If you're not on mute, it would be great if you could mute yourselves, please. So I think we'll begin because we're already a few minutes in. Welcome to this Women in STEM seminar series. Today, we're looking at preserving emotional health in an academic career. Just so you're all aware, we are recording this session and um, it's going to be posted online on the Grantham Institute's YouTube channel. So you'll be able to have a look at it after the session. It's a delight to be here with you all. Um, I was really honored to be asked by, by Lily and Paloma to chair this session a topic that's really close to my heart. Um, my name is Vida, I'm your chair for today and I'm a behavioural change coach. So I work a lot with people um, in, the, in the world of wellbeing and emotional wellbeing um, and mental health. And we've got Anna and Yael with us today, calling in from completely different time zones. Um, Yael is at 6.30 a.m. from California and Anna is in Brunei and it's 9.30 p.m. So, um, yeah, amazing that we're actually able to even do this in this in this day and age. We are incredibly connected um, and that we can hold these sessions online on Zoom. So all of these series are going to be held on Zoom. They're going to be running every two months. Um, I'll let you know at the end of this about what we've got coming up next. Um, and yeah, it, let's get started, really. So this series was set up um, to give underrepresented people a platform to share their voice and share their experiences and everybody is welcome to be here we really hope that the audience will be very varied with lots of different diverse experiences and perspectives um, and really it's about women who are working in STEM and focusing on climate change in the environment so that's going to be the focus of the series. Um, it's been set up by the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the Grantham Institute. Lily Peck and Paloma Ortega are the two who've created the seminar series. So if you've got any um, ideas or feedback or want to get in touch with them directly, then they are the people um, to speak to. And over this session, um, if you have any questions that come to mind, please either pop them in the chat directly because Lily and Ortega and Paloma will be monitoring that chat. Um, or if you'd like your question to be anonymous, then you can just message either of them directly and they'll feed some of the questions to me because we'll have an open Q&A at the end. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end for that open Q&A, depending on um, how much time we have. So yeah, let's get started. Um, I've introduced myself very briefly. I'm Vida, I work mostly with, with actually engineers and um, people working in technology sectors. And I also work with the NHS in the healthcare um, sector and different kind of educational bodies like the Grantham Institute. I've done some wellbeing sessions for PhD students um, at the Grantham Institute before. And as a coach, I really believe that our minds and our bodies are the same system. And so if we um, look after ourselves, look after our own uh, mental, emotional, physical well-being, you know, our, our heart, we've got a circularity system with the blood pumping around our heart, um, our central nervous system, which, which is the system that is activated when we feel stressed. Um, and so to look after ourselves to really be well is really important so we can go out there and do the incredibly important work that you're all doing, uh, which is why I feel so honored to be able to be chairing this session because I really believe in um, finding solutions for us to live sustainably in this world. So that's kind of my, my uh, mission is if I can support the human system to be well, then um, as a kind of human species, I hope we can go out there and build um, a way to be well on this planet. And that's the kind of work that, that I'm sure most of you do um, that have tuned into this today and, and maybe other things as well. So I have a lot of respect for you all. Um, and now before we start with the questions, I would love Anna um, and then Yael to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna hand over to Anna so she can just tell you a little bit about herself before we move on. 
Okay, hello all there and thanks Vida for the, this introduction and of course to Paloma and Lily for, for the opportunity of, of tell you a bit uh, about what I do and about myself and I'd like to actually start with you and, and how all uh, as scientists we uh, often feel a lot of emotions because it's very common that we love our job right and this is something I see over and over on the students I work with my colleagues myself maybe you feel like that this is just an example. I, I, I'm an entomologist and one of my colleagues seen this, he made these beautiful earrings and we all love to wear them eh, with these insects, which for some people might be a bit gross, right? But we really love these things. And more in the general field of STM, what also uh, happens is that when uh, often when we started this job, we imagine ourselves being there out in the field or in the lab doing all this work. But then the reality is when I say this boom, maybe you can yes, move this. And yeah, that it's not really this, right? You end up being more in the office, behind the desk, trying to, to bang yourself to, to get that writing done. And then this will generate a lot of problems. And that's why I say that being a scientist is beautiful, but it's also hard. And it's no surprise that problems of mental health are uh, very common in this profession. And, and also the topic of this, uh, this, this seminar, and not only the mental health, uh, maybe Paloma, you can also skip, but, uh, and, and that I hope that you realize that mental health matters not only for you as a person, but also as, as the work you do, but also your emotional health. Eh? And this, I love that, that, that the topic was this one. And then just quickly about myself. So like I said, I'm, I'm an entomologist. I was working with plants and microbes first in Spain and in the Netherlands where I did most of my postdoc career. And maybe some of you already feel like this, that that task just keep being more and more and more editor editorial tasks, experiments, publications, and it's just a an, an never ending story. Eh? And well, like, often happens I was exhausted and and then it was at this point where uh, the uncertainty was big so maybe yeah <laughs> so then as opposed to you you see that okay where am I going to end up so I decided to just yes, follow my husband's career something that happens a lot uh, maybe we can also talk about that. And, and yes, after being in, a, in one of these creative void of what do I do now with my life? Well, I became a yoga teacher and I combined both passions uh, into what I, uh, is now my business that of I focus and write, where I help scientists to write their papers and with productivity. And well, what I do there and what I want for you, for all scientists out there, is that you can have a more productive, creative, and then happier academic life. And the how I do that is, uh, well, I have two main courses that, by the way, they will open soon. Uh, you can have a look if you are interested, one about productivity and one about writing. And, and what we follow there is what I call this mindful approach, or this it's, it's an approach typical from mindfulness but that you can apply on your work, on everything you do. And it's first this awareness, notice what is happening around you, especially when those bad thoughts, limiting beliefs start creeping in, into your head, just noticing and then take a positive response. Just argue with those voices, answer back, and then very important, keep moving take action, do that thing that is, that is scaring you, send that email, uh, write the paper, even if it's only a couple of sentences, just break that loop where you get blocked. And this is uh, basically about me. Thanks a lot for uh, having the opportunity to introduce. Thank you so much, Anna. It's lovely to hear more about, um, about you and your work. Oh, I'm blurry. Um, yeah, Yale, um, please, we'd love to hear more about you and, and you know, your background. Great, I'll just take a few minutes and I apologize if my cat contributes to the um, conversation, she's very loud. So uh, I'm here today, um, well, I think there's a couple of reasons why I'm on this panel. The first is that I did my PhD at Imperial College. Um, so I'm excited to be speaking to Imperial College students again, for those who are in the audience. Um, and I actually work in, in climate science now at the city of San Jose, which is near San Francisco in the Bay Area. Uh, but along the way, I took a very wandery path um, and uh, had a lot of mental health struggles and, and challenges. So 
uh, after my PhD, I did a postdoc. Uh, and after that left academia, um, it, for me, it was at the time way too much pressure and I didn't feel, um, it didn't feel good. <laughs> so uh, we can talk about that more later, but I, I did leave academia and, uh, you know, I call it here freelancing for a while. Um, I worked in space biology, which was a bit random, and then stumbled into climate work, which uh, turns out for now at least to be a really good match of um, the quantitative skills that I learned in my PhD with uh, sustainability, which I'm really passionate about. Um, but, you know, I'm still figuring things out. Uh, and uh, one of the big things that I'm trying to do um, every day in my work and in my personal life is to be open about my experiences with mental health um, to contribute in that little way to um, as helping spread awareness. Um, the one thing I wanna say before we go on to the discussion, if you can go to the next slide, Paloma, thank you, is that uh, I know that when I was a scientist uh, or at least an academic scientist, I looked at other people's CVs a lot and it often made me feel really bad because CVs look really good. So I just wanted to point out, using my own as an example of how they hide things and they're only the good side um, and everybody has a story behind that may look a little bit messier. So for instance, on mine here at the bottom, on the left, it says that I finished my PhD in 2010. And then on the right, you see that I started my postdoc in 2012. So there was a big gap in there when I was applying to things and had no idea what I was going to do. Um, and that's just kind of nicely hidden away by not, if you don't look at the dates. And then the next one, uh, if you can go to the next slide, is this time from 2014 to 2017, where it says I was an illustrator, artist, and scientific consultant. And really what was going on at that time is that I was very depressed, unemployed, um, and getting a few gigs here and there. So um, just want to, you to know one example of the, the real life that can be behind these supposedly perfectly and shiny looking CVs. Um, so that's enough about me. Let's go on to the discussion. Thank you so much, Yale. And um, you're making such an important point, which is what this discussion is really about, which is us building awareness by opening up this space where people can share their experiences and, and also um, really honestly about, about what you have experienced. Um, and that's where lots of these questions are focused on. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that and also you too, Anna. So the first question that we're looking at today um, are focusing on some of the challenges that you or other people that you know may have faced while working in academia. So it would be really useful to hear from, from both of you. Um, actually, Yale, why don't you start, given um, we were already sort of talking about that. What are some of the challenges that, that you may have faced to your mental health and emotional well-being um, in your own experience or, or that you've witnessed others more generally? Sure. Thank you, Vida. Um, I think for me, I would say the, the top the top things that I struggled with, and I know that Anna is going to touch on this as well, is um, perfectionism, imposter syndrome, and self-doubt. Uh, I think the current culture of academia really focuses, people talk a lot about how good other scientists are. And for me, that felt like it set up a constant comparison, kind of a pressure for me to compare myself to others and see like, was I good enough? And I, I just felt a ton of self-doubt no matter how well I had done in school or um, and especially in my, well, it was worse after my PhD, but I found the PhD difficult in that I never had a yardstick to know if I was doing well or not. I was just kind of like uh, I had years of working and then at the end I was gonna fail or <laughs> succeed. It was very stressful. Um, and, and I wonder uh, how much of the self-doubt that I felt was from being female just because of the way that we're socialized growing up. Um, I think, you know, nowadays I'm looking at everything through, through the lens of wondering about like societal biases. And it feels like there's a lot there just under the surface that's, that's subtle and it's hard to pick out because it's not like overt discrimination. You can't just say like, well, that person didn't give me a job because I'm female, but um, how much are, are men and women socialized differently in terms of confidence and how they speak. And um, 
I think there's a lot there. And so I think, anyway, uh, we can talk later about possible solutions, but um, that's something I struggled with a lot. Also, when I was doing my PhD, I, I feel like I was very young. I think maybe at the time being in my mid twenties felt old, but now looking back, I know that I was very inexperienced and, um, and hadn't really run into struggles like that before. And nobody was talking about mental health at that time. So I'm glad that it's talked about so much more now, but um, I didn't even know that I needed that kind of support or, or where to find it. Um, the last thing I would say is that uh, on the topic of women in STEM is that looking around at my friends who I did my PhD with, um, three of my best friends are, you know, we lived together during our PhDs and they're all brilliant. Um, none of them are professors at the moment. Uh, only one is still working as an academic scientist, but two of them have husbands who are professors. And, you know, it just makes me wonder, it's like an anecdotal, but how did that turn out that way? Um, their husbands also did their PhDs with us. We all were at the same institution uh, and around the same people but different pressures are pushing us in different directions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. It's really um, talking about a lot of things that I, I see in the, the clients I work with too, um, both in kind of academia as well as the other sectors I've mentioned, you know, it continues in the professional world, in the corporate world of, um, women working in, in big um, engineering companies or, or technology companies, as well as most sectors really. Um, and this idea of imposter syndrome is something I think so many of us can relate to. Um, and it, it's such a relief to just talk about it openly. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and you know these ideas of, of self-doubt that you've mentioned. Anna, what about you? Uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced or that you've seen others face, um, especially in your work, I would imagine, um, and your personal experience? Yeah, so imposter syndrome, I'm, I'm, I say I'm, I'm a big fan of, of this because for me it was a shock when I discovered that existed as such. So the I always say like during the PhD, I didn't suffer it that much. I was, I guess, average in my PhD program. But then was when I moved to the Netherlands and, and, uh, and now I have a lot of students that have that, that when they go to a very good group, then they are like, oh my God, everyone around me is so good. I'm really the the worst uh, of the of the place, and something that is is amazing. But the students I have in the courses, I would say almost everyone has it. And I was looking at some statistics. They they say that about eighty percent of high achievers have it. And and from what I've read, yeah, they indeed say that especially women or other minorities uh, suffer it more than uh, yeah than uh, let's say uh, men, especially white men, heterosexual white men. So yeah, I, I was also one of those victims of this uh, imposter syndrome. And, and, and in the beginning, yeah, feeling completely alone, thinking that it's only you and, and, and feeling so lonely yeah, with that. But then when you hear that it's so common that everybody has it at some point, then, yeah, I don't know, it's such a relief, right, to know that, uh, yeah, this feeling of you are not alone, that, that for me was a big thing with, well, with imposter syndrome and, and with many of the other things. And just to put a bit of a, of a comedy touch into, into this, because at this I even feel like uh, in the topics of, of mental health or, or emotional health, I even wonder, like, oh, is this, is this that I'm feeling bad enough, you know? Is, 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 this actually considered something like a mental health problem or not, you know? So, so it's, it can be this acute. And well, uh, I, and it's, it's also funny because even after seven years of, of being a postdoc, still when I got my next postdoc in another center, I thought I had the imposter syndrome under control and it came back again with the same stories. It just keeps coming back. And uh, I, I was telling this story to one of my students and then she said, well, Anna, I started my new postdoc and everything else you told us that happened to you was happening to me. Yeah? This 
this feeling of uh, oh I when they discover that I don't know so much as they think maybe they fire me and uh, and yeah again feelings one so you know yes Yes, now I'm, I've, I think I've learned to accept that it's just gonna pop up every time I do something new that I find difficult or scary, like also giving a talk. Eh? I always have the day I give a talk, this, oh my God, it's gonna be a mess, it's gonna be a disaster. And uh, then it's never that bad. <laughs> so yeah, I guess uh, we need to just uh, learn to, to live with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious in this video, like, because you're working, like you said, with engineers, which is also a typical male bias profession. So indeed, if, if you see that females have it more than males. It, it's both. It's a human, it's a human experience. Um, and I, yeah, it's an interesting question. I've, I've definitely worked with both men and women who have felt similarly and even just hearing you share what you shared there's this constant judgment right you said am I even feeling bad enough to say that I am experiencing um a, a mental health problem or that I'm feeling low or that I'm feeling depressed and within all the work I do the most important first step is, is just to make a little bit of space as we're doing here and just say hey like <laughs> I, I, I acknowledge that this is where I'm at today. And if I'm feeling depressed today, it doesn't mean I'm going to be depressed forever. It's just it, acknowledging I'm feeling insecure mm. right now. Um, because often if, if we are sat here and our heart rate's going like, like you say, I'm giving a talk. Oh, okay, my, my heart's going like this. I feel sweaty. Yeah. Um, just, oh, okay, I'm, that's how I'm feeling. That's my experience. I'm feeling anxious, that's okay. And you just, your whole system slows down and, and that's how we, we slow down our, our um, central nervous system to reactivate the parasympathetic system that, that keeps us um, well and, and, and in that rest and digest, that repair state where everything slows down. So just acknowledging all of these things is hugely important. Um, which is kind of this, what this first question is about and brings me on to the second question. Although before we move on, Anna, I would, cause I believe you are a mother as well. Um, and yes. I think it might be for people to hear a bit about your experience as a mother as well, um, as a woman, before we move on to the second question, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So actually part of that picture of me crashing on the bed is, is also the picture of, of, I think any mother of uh, small kids, like I say, my child didn't sleep a full night until it was four years old. So, you know, the, on top of everything, being sick is, is this contact, constant non-sleeping uh, yourself. And, and even in, in maybe, maybe there are fathers here and, and we acknowledge eh, that, that uh, there are fathers out there that are doing a lot. And also academia can be hard for them, but the data is what they show that even like even now with the pandemic, the mothers have been more affected than the fathers in terms also of publications and other type of work. So there is something there that we cannot deny. And in the end, we, we spend all these uh, months carrying a baby inside us, later breastfeeding some, some of us, and then the, the nice to sleep. And, and then, yeah, that puts just an extra challenge in, in all the situation of, of being a, a woman in, in STM. Eh? And there's a message out there, things get easier. <laughs> I usually say that everything just gets worse, except those early years of maternity and work. That, I think, in my case and what I see is that those, that gets easier. So yes, to, to put a bit of hope there. Thank you, Anna. And also, you know, when we're talking about preserving your emotional well-being in, in an academic career, a lot I, I start when I'm working with people, this idea that um, taking care of ourselves is is not selfish. So there's, you know, Audrey Lord, who is the African-American um, poet and activist. She describes self-care like this. She says, taking care of myself is not a self-indulgence. It is a self-preservation. And that's an act of political warfare. So for her as an activist, 
you know, taking care of herself, her mind and her body enables her to go and do that work. And there's something that many of us find really difficult, especially if we're mothers or um, we have children, other dependents, you know, a baby depends on us to live, to, to actually put our emotional well-being, um, give it a priority. And, and uh, I imagine as well, when we're working on our PhD projects or other um, academic or professional projects, you know, they become, they, we almost create them. You know, there's something quite maternal about creating these projects as well. Um, and so actually a really big message that I share with people a lot is, is actually taking care of yourself is really important and for you to be committed to that. Um, and of course that becomes harder and harder the more the more plates you're spinning if you if you also have a family and children and you know your PhD project and perhaps like Yale you've got your, your artwork as well so there's lots of different um, calls to our attention all the time yeah. and the truth is until we're taking care of ourselves we're no use to anyone else anyway. <laughs> no and something also that I it happened to me and I see also uh, to a lot of mothers, colleagues, friends, and uh, also many of my students, that most scientists are perfectionists, right? This is kind of a common trait. Yes. And, and it all also invades this, this part of our life. Eh? So we also want to be perfect mothers. And just like for everything, it's not possible. But we end up with a constant guilt. So often you feel guilty because you are working too much and not giving enough attention to those kids children or because you are not working enough and not finishing your work. So it's, suddenly you are in a constant guilt uh, zone there that is very difficult to get out. But like you said, like indeed the like self-care is kind of a revolutionary art act and you need to really go for it. And in the end, well, one of the things that I always say is rest is productive in the end. Eh? So even if you are an ambitious scientist out there, remember that rest is productive too. Hundred percent. I completely agree. Yeah. And that moves us <laughs> perfectly to the second question, um, which is about you know what what you found useful um, in your work in terms of any resources or practices or or other role models or people that have been really supportive to you um, and yeah I wonder um, Yale if we could hear from you what what's been really useful to support you and your your um, mental health and emotional well-being. Sure uh, I guess I would start by following on from what Anna was just saying I feel like my mental and emotional health have really improved over the years as I have more and more accepted that it is impossible to do everything and perfection is impossible. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I struggle with that a lot. So I gave myself a tattoo last year that says good enough, because that's something that I come back to a lot as like when I get worried about doing everything well, I think, well, you know, I just need to do it or want to do it good enough. And for me, that helps a lot. Um, um, as far as specific to being in academia, although I think all of these lessons uh, go to whatever exact field you're in, um, I have a, lot of, a couple of different specific suggestions. I think one is to focus on doing work that you enjoy rather than trying to see, trying to be the best. Um, or, or worry about like, are you being good at what you do? I think, I mean, we all want to be good at what we do and we can try to develop our skills, but I think that the, the core is to do something that is work that is good for you. And then the rest comes with that. And the people I know who succeed the best in have been succeeding the best in science are the ones who are doing it because they like the work and not because they're trying to be good at it. Um, and that's something that, that I have struggled with to figure out. It's not like it's simple. Um, another thing that I think is key is, or can be key is choosing your workplace based on its culture. Um, so going somewhere where there are people who are supportive and who uh, come to work as whole people rather than um, 
letting their work be everything. Um, and in my academic career, I always chose places based on the topic of study. And, um, you know, it's not like I was in any like terrible environments, but I think that I didn't, I, I turned down at some um, opportunities, people who would have been really good mentors because I thought that I wanted to study something else. And it's a really difficult trade-off, but I think it's worth weighing both sides. Um, also just for, I want everybody to know that it is hard, like, you know, uh, working in academia, being a human, <laughs> like balancing work and life, like it's just hard and to know that everybody has struggles. Um, and then the last thing I would say that has helped me a lot is um, talking about what I'm going through with therapists and also with close people. I think, uh, yeah, like going out, for, going out to the pub during my PhD was a very important part of uh, doing well as a PhD student. So I would just really encourage people to talk um, about what they're going through. Thank you so much. It's, it, it loops back to what you said at the beginning of good enough, because you are good enough. Um, and and you know, in everything you're sharing there, and also this sense of connecting, because when we can feel very isolated, when we feel like we're going through something on our own, and actually um, when we're connected to other humans, um, and like you say, talking to people, it can really help. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And Anna, what about you? Any, any practices or experiences that you found particularly useful or that people you know have found particularly supportive? Yes, well, yeah, of course. I di I didn't initially thought about about the people aspect, but for me, that is one of the of the big pillars. Eh? And and I have uh, great friends from every place where I, where I've worked, and I, I say they were my angels. I cannot imagine doing a, a science without those people around you that you can cry and, and ask for help and, and feel completely relaxed in, in their company. So I, I always tell my students, find your angels and, and nurture the, those relationships because uh, that, that makes all the, all the difference, definitely. But yeah, other things is um, this awareness. Eh? For me, like I said, like discovering that imposter syndrome was a thing that existed and that they had all these typical things that you might experience eh? or that the, um, I, I forgot to also mention before, I'm, I also discovered during my postdoc, actually after my baby was born, that I, I was what is called a highly sensitive person. About 20% of the people are, maybe 20% of this audience are. And that also explained a lot of the things that were going around with me that I was always like, oh, why do I have this? Why can I not focus in this open space? And why I'm so I'm taking so personal my experiments or, or this bad um, answer that someone has given to me. Yeah? And, uh, and again, knowing that this was uh, something that those many people experience out there and putting a name and, and again, knowing those typical things that I was having uh, because of that, that uh, reassured me a lot and, and helped me know myself better. And therefore also identify those things that, okay, when this thought is starting to crawl in is, you know, it's because I'm doing something that uh, is scary or, and, and that again, made me feel more uh, uh, secure of myself knowing that wasn't my fault, it was just this thing. <laughs> so that was really good, this, this uh, self-awareness, which in the end brings you into all these things, right? Of reading more about it, listening to podcasts or, or just getting yourself uh, informed. And then, well, of course, uh, practicing yoga and meditation, mindfulness. I say that everyone should have their own mindful practice, whatever it, that is. If even if it's just a, a walk outside, just yes, uh, mindfully, let's say, then, uh, or maybe even running for some people, just yes, the experience of running can be a mindful activity in itself, whatever it is. But I think we, we need those. Uh, those moments like Vida you were saying eh, to activate this parasympathetic system that otherwise takes 
over our whole uh, body and mind. So having that that practice also it helped a lot. Although I'm not always the most consistent person, but I always go back over and over, and that that has been really helpful. And what else? Let me see. I have some notes here. Well, yeah, of course, having um, for me having a system like having structures, like uh, having a system for my writing, for my productivity, for my uh, way of doing the stats, or um, like like knowing this that I had these tools that I could follow these steps and I could deliver something again good enough. Eh? that maybe wasn't going to be the masterpiece that at least would be done. And, and that also gave me a lot of security eh, to know yeah. that uh, yeah, I could always go to that. Yeah. And, and it m m makes me think of having like a system for your well-being too, you know, like a daily ritual, whatever that mm -hmm. might be, um, which I talk a lot with my clients to so say, how do you wake up in the morning? How do you get yourself ready for the day? What are the things that you might do? So having a little bit of a system to the self-care system as well as as a experiment system I'm sure many of you are really um really skilled at being highly organized with with all of your experiments and research projects and um just just to kind of build some practices in and and like you say build self-awareness because when you're able to be present in the moment you can feel how you're actually feeling you can feel if you're feeling stressed or scared or anxious. Um, so yes, thank you so much. So moving on to the last question, um, before we go into a Q&A. So if any of you do have some questions for the Q&A, do drop them in the chat or message Lily and Paloma directly. Um, and the last question that we kind of have prepared for you all today is, what do you feel needs to be done systemically, right? So we've been focusing very much on the individual. Um, and also we are fully aware that we exist in a system. We, we're talking here about the system of academia and also kind of um, outside of that more professionally that the, the world of STEM. And so what, what do you feel, um, Anna, that, and then I'll come to you next, Yale, but Anna, what do you feel needs to be done more systemically in order to support people's um, emotional well-being. Yeah, so first, again, this awareness that that I, in my case, I discovered some of these things accidentally, let's say, but talks like this one, for example, eh, that is organized by the institution itself. And eh, I'm sure that you facilitate also this type of workshops, right, for, for institutions. I think this is making a big difference at the institutional level. So people know they are not alone. And what I'm also hoping is that the, the professors, the more senior academics also open themselves and, and share these experiences because uh, yeah, when when only the PhDs go to these events, if it's, they are the only ones that have the problem, when not everybody is having or has gone through this. And and when you know that people that you admire, that you look up, uh, and that you're inspired by them, have had this similar experience, I think again that uh, motivates you to also, uh, yeah, live with that and accept it as, as part of who you are. So this awareness overall, that I think that's that's quite important. And then more specifically, again, as a mother, I, the, the time aspect of, of, the, of being a mother still has quite some work to do. Uh, we have many grants that give extension and that has helped. But again, from what we see from numbers, it's not enough. It's, it's, that time is not yet enough. So there is work there to do. And then I still dream with this, this kind of funding for when, not only when, when you are a mother, but also when, when you know, you maybe have a sick leave, maybe because of mental health or any other problem, uh, that there is uh, some sort of fun for someone to continue doing your job. I say like, if you are a doctor, when you are on leave or you are sick, someone operates your patients, right? They are not just accumulating there in the operation room. But for us, yes, the experiments are accumulating, the papers accumulate, they're waiting to be written. So apparently some countries already have these kind of uh, funds 
to that you can hire some some researcher or maybe some assistant that can can help when when we uh, women are on leave. That would be amazing. I dream with that. And and then I, I have the well, in general, the culture of academia needs needs hard work eh? and in some countries more than others and one is on the, on the level of diversity and here we are talking about uh, women in, in, in academia in STM but, uh, Lily also mentioned eh, it's, it's not only exclusive to, to women eh? uh, we need to promote diversity in academia because it's the basis of uh, evolution eh, of, of the new ideas and all type of diversity, neurodiversity, uh, race uh, diversity, gender, everything, and all types of diversity. And although I think, at least my experience in the Netherlands is that efforts are, are being made, but yet still we haven't reached that level. And, and from what I hear from students, um, maybe yeah, you have this experience in the US, there are still many places where they are, have hard, hard, hard work to do yet. Well, I mean, probably in, in many places in Europe too. So that this diversity, uh, there is a lot to do. And also the culture of overwork. Eh? I, like we are here saying like, race is productive, take care of your, of your body. And, and, but when you see in the lab that the, the supervisors are, are promoting mm -hmm. this overwork and praising it and everybody's trying to make it work like they are working a lot, this is not healthy, this needs to change. And um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Anna. And um, it comes back to what you said at the beginning of, of role modeling, really, which is, and this is so true of all the organizations I work in, is, is as above as below. And so if you have an institution that's being run and at the top level, um, you know, the priorities are, as you say, overworking, um, then of course people are going to find it incredibly difficult to be well within that, that environment. And so with the awareness, um, with, with platforms like this, where we're sharing different perspectives and experiences, hopefully we can build more awareness so that people actually recognize, and especially people in leadership positions, mm -hmm. um, because how powerful if your supervisor is not just telling you take care of yourself, well, you can see they take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So you can see, oh, well, there's, there's congruency in what they're doing and saying, and that's something that we can believe in as people, because as humans, we know what's going on. <laughs> you know, if, if the, the leader of an organization, of the institution is telling us one thing, but doing another. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and um, Yael, what, what do you, what do you feel needs to be done systemically? Oh man, there's so much to say. Uh, but first, I completely 100% agree with what you were just saying, Vida, that, um, uh, yeah, it depends, it, you know, like, it, it comes from above the, the values of an organization. And, and I think, uh, more than anything else, I would love to see the culture of academia and the whole work world that we live in. I mean, the city where I work as well is better, but it still has a ways to go. I think, um, <clears throat> I feel like at the moment, academia, above all values and valorizes like brilliant individuals and our, our media does this as well like bring you know holding up like a single scientist and talking about how much they sacrificed and how brilliant they are as if that is like the ultimate scientist and i i would love to just destroy that ideal and have the ultimate scientist be somebody who works in a team who learns from the previous discoveries who does things outside of being a scientist, who has a family, who is involved in their community, who is a, a, a full person, uh, who um, teaches, who contributes to their field in ways other than writing papers or making discoveries. And how do we get there? I don't, I don't know. It's, um, I think, I mean, we can't just march up to I can't march up to the dean of a university and say you need to change your idea of what the ideal scientist is but I think that 
all of us can, you know, to the extent that we are able, because different we have different levels of power. And if you're just trying to get a job and you need that job, then you have less power because, you know, you need to do what you need to do. But to the extent that we can embody our own values and the ideals that we would like to see and push on the people above us to the extent that we can, um, I think that's really important because we all do have power to, to mm -hmm. some extent, to contribute to the culture that we're in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what else was I going to say? That covered a lot of it. The one other thing that I would say is that, um, yeah, uh, publications are still like the thing in academia. And I, I just really wish that there was more um, recognition uh, in, in institutional, like in, um, in the UK and the research councils, how they evaluate institutions and at all levels uh, when people are hired for jobs, just to recognize the value of other kinds of work as well. But because many of us um, put so much effort into teaching, into supporting others, into um, reviewing papers, into all these things that are not all into mentorship um, that are not valued uh, at the crucial stages in an academic career. And then the same goes in the work environment. Like I put a lot of energy into um, supporting the fellows who work with me, the interns who work with me, trying to, and, and does that get valued uh, by my superiors sometimes. Um, so I think for all of us, maybe it's something to, to hold until we are in the position of being a supervisor or a professor or someone who has some power, then think, how do you want the culture to be in the place where you are? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's the power of the narrative, right, that really struck me when you said, oh, in the papers, look at this scientist who sacrificed so much. And then we believe that that's part of our story. In order to be a successful scientist, we have to sacrifice. And, and then we have all these judgments and self-doubts that come in. If you're not good enough, you're not working hard enough. And, and, and it's just completely... Um, Links. And also just not everybody can make those sacrifices. It's a lot easier to make, yeah. to put all your time into your work if you have somebody at home cooking your meals and taking care of your kids. And yeah. if you don't have a sick relative to take care of, and if you don't have a family that you need to send money back to, um, et cetera. And, and actually, you know, who, who, why, why should sac making all those sacrifices equal successful scientists? Like, that equation doesn't add up to me. It just seems like some story that's been around for a while. And what I hear in, in you is, well, you know, um, if you can have these conversations because we are, we, we do build the culture. Culture is this word, which is quite abstract, but it's made up of people. Um, and we all have our part to play in that. And, and obviously the, the more um, influence we have, the, the more power we have in how we can change that. Um, and you know when you were saying imagine if when we're supervisors and you're changing the narrative um I got quite excited <laughs> I got goosebumps when I heard you say that one, um, one thing I would just add really quickly that I was thinking earlier and meant to say is that I do think it's super important to realize that um the systemic or the structure that we're in I think it is very you already said it but I just so agree that it's very easy to feel like we are the problem and and I don't think that any of us are, even if somebody has like tendencies to feel anxious or is struggling with depression, with the right structure, you would be fine. You would have support. You would be able to thrive in whatever field you wanted to, but we don't have the right structure. So I just, I think that's so important to come back to again and again, that no individual person is the problem. I, I'm really glad you said that. And again, I have have some goosebumps hearing you. I, I completely fully support that, that message. So we're going to move on to a couple of questions that have come in the chat. Um, and the first one is, um, can we recommend any books or podcasts that help? So I guess something that you may have read or listened to, um, Yale or Anna, that you found particularly useful, if anything comes to mind. I think there's a ton and uh, different things work for everybody. 
Um, but what I would say is that I have, what has helped me a lot is um, Buddhist philosophy. Uh, like, for instance, there's a book called Things Fall Apart by Pema Children. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but um, just that really helps me step back and see the big picture and think about what I really value and how I want to live my life. Thank you. We can, we can put these recommendations, I think, perhaps with the follow-up email. So if anyone's wondering about these, um, we can add them in. Um, Anna, what about you? Yes, I, I'm quite a podcast fan and I, I kind of started with one called The Good Life Project. Maybe I can try it in the chat. It's very nice. It, it's really long. It has all type of uh, episodes. It's very, very inspiring. Not, not about scientists, yes, people. <laughs> and, and then also a bit more recently, I, I read this book, The Happiness, Happiness Project. That, uh, yeah, it, I, it, was, it was very nice. I also put it here, that is a, a book. Yeah, thank you. One that I've um, read recently, which is a really useful, it's a very practical book. It's called um, The Listening Path by Julia Cameron. And she it's the second book she's written. And um, she, she talks about the active free flow writing, which is where you just bring pen to paper and you just write stream of consciousness. And also she has other practices in there, which is which are all about listening. Um, you know, Anna and I were talking about practices to kind of be present and mindful, um, which is all about listening to your environment and then listening into yourself. Um, and it's a very practical book. So um, that's one that has some, some activities that you can get into as well. Um, I'm gonna read out the second question. We've had three similar 